And welcome to episode 15 of the David Bernard Podcast. I'm along with Fox A meteorologist Zach Fredella today. We've got an interesting topic today, Zach. What if I told you there is a method that could reasonably and accurately predict weather patterns up to 300 days away? And not just patterns, specific storms and maybe even hurricanes. Well, there's a man out there that believes it, he's researched it, and he uses it. Today, we're going to speak with Gary Lezak. Gary has been a good friend of mine for many years. He's the chief meteorologist for the embassy affiliate in Kansas City. And Gary's been studying this uh, for decades, a hypothesis. This was uh, first observed by another meteorologist 70 almost 80 years ago. It's known as the cycling pattern hypothesis. In short, uh, the belief is there are patterns in the atmosphere that repeat in such a way that forecasts for mainly, I would say, big weather events can be foreseen up to almost a year in advance, 300 days. And that number 300 is significant, and we're going to talk to Gary about that. Uh, Gary, through his own observation and research, has coined it the Lezak recurring cycle, and he's been studying this and using it uh, since the 1980s. The LRC, we've been talking about this, you and I have been talking about this for over a year now, and it, it's, this is some interesting stuff. I'm really excited about today's podcast because I want to know more. I mean, as meteorologists studying any type of scientific things that can help us better understand what's going on and maybe forecast in advance, that's all great. And we've known, I mean, we learned about this in school. You have teleconnections, you have the the El Nino, La Nina. We know about all of these long-term type impacts that that can have on the weather, but we don't have something that specifically can point to, hey, maybe this might be a reoccurring time that you could see a storm or in this case, a hurricane. That's what we are more kind of in tune to, uh, like a specific point of the year or a specific point of hurricane season where we need to watch for maybe a hurricane strike. That's what this kind of goes along those lines. And so that's why I'm excited to learn a little bit more and um, and see exactly how this all comes to be and how you know he figured this out uh, in the long run. Well, there are a number of examples that he can point to over the years, and especially we're going to hone in on tropical activity. Obviously, that's of great interest to us here uh, along the Gulf Coast. We also have on today's podcast, Eric Buris, and Eric is a broadcast meteorologist in Orlando, and he has studied Gary's atmospheric recurring cycle theory, and he even uses it uh, at his own local station. So we're going to get uh, his feedback on how that's gone over at the station and with his fellow meteorologists and viewers in Central Florida. And right now we actually have Fred out there. We've been tracking Fred for the past several days and Fred is part of this whole cycle. And that's one thing, one reason why I, I was looking at Eric's uh, social media accounts and whatnot. And he's been saying, hey, mid-August, we have to watch out in Florida. And sure enough, Fred's forecast right now takes it towards Florida. So that's part of that whole LRC, the cycle. So on that note, uh, let's bring in today's guests, Gary Lezak and Eric Buris. Gary and Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is going to be an exciting discussion. I made a very brief description of the cycling pattern hypothesis uh, during our introduction here a few moments ago, uh, but we want to hear it from you, Gary. Uh, to begin with, who is Jerome? Now I'm going to mess it up. Namias. Namias. Jerome Namias. Let's start with him. He is. Uh, he was head of the Weather Bureau the long range forecasting division of the Weather Bureau in the 1940s and 1950s. And he developed this thing. He, he published a couple hundred papers in a couple books. Um, and one of them was called the Index Cycle. And I stumbled across his work when uh, I was writing my peer reviewed paper on the cycling pattern hypothesis, which is known as the LRC. But Dr. Fred Carr said, have you ever heard of uh, Jerome Nemias? And I said, uh, no. And he said, you should read this paper called The Index Cycle. It sounds similar to your hypothesis. So I read through it and he was close to what my theory is. And uh, he had discovered that by November, there's enough information in the weather patterns to know what's gonna happen the following winter. And for some reason, uh, for weeks at a time, uh, a cycle can exist, but what he didn't realize is that that entire cycle repeats over and over and over again, all the way till October when the new pattern sets up. So 
Uh, but he is the first one that I know of that actually had something similar to what we're sharing with you today here. So when we talk about the cycling pattern hypothesis, um, dig in just a little bit more about uh, what we're talking about, because we're going to we're going to talk so uh, meteorologists out there will understand. But also uh, for folks that aren't meteorologists that are listening, um, we're, we're talking about using patterns globally to predict this. Correct. Right. Uh, the, the basic there's basics to the what the cycling pattern hypothesis is, which uh, our bloggers back in 2002, 2003 actually named it after me the Lezak Recurring Cycle, or the LRC. I just call it my hypothesis. They thought it should have a name, so it stuck as the LRC. And what I had developed in the 1980s, behind me on my wall, you might see this mural of pictures, and that's when I first sort of discovered it or affirmed up what this was all about. In 1987 and 1988, there was a major one-foot snowstorm in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, and they only average eight inches of snow a year. And about five, six weeks later, seven weeks later, there was another one foot snowstorm in Oklahoma City, not to mention ice storms and major winter, almost like what they just had this past winter. And I noticed that the pattern that produced the major snowstorm, the second one, looked awfully similar to the first one. And I was beginning to realize then that there was a relationship. Years later, fast forward to 2002, 2003, 15 years later, um, I I developed the hypothesis where a pattern sets up every early fall, late September, early October, around October 5th, 6th, or 7th is when it really begins. And it becomes established. And these things called anchor ridges and troughs set up and they tell you where the storm systems are going to reach peak strength and weakest strength, where the anchor ridges are weakest and where the anchor troughs are where the storms are strongest. And then the pattern sets up. There's a cycle that develops. This year's cycle just happens to be about 46 to 47 days. Every year is different. So this fall, a brand new pattern will set up that's never happened before. And then, then the entire pattern repeats. So it's not just the tropics that follow this everything within the northern hemisphere does so uh, from china japan where the tokyo olympics were across europe all the way to the united states north america mexico um, the entire pattern is under the influence of this cycle cycling pattern and you can make predictions based off of it that's basically what it is all about what is the significance of october um I'm not exactly 100% certain. I've got an idea that the sun sets at the North Pole on the autumnal equinox. So this every year, autumnal equinox, the sun sets at the North Pole. But here, you know, in Louisiana and Florida and Kansas City, the, we have about an hour of twilight and then it gets dark. At the North Pole, it's about 10 days to two weeks of twilight, and then it gets dark. It finally is dark at the North Pole. Right about the time that it goes to total darkness is right around the time, October 5th, 6th, or 7th, two weeks after the, the solstice, uh, the vernal equinox. And, um, and that's about the time. So there's got to be some astronomical cause or reason if that hypothesis is correct. But something like that happens in the fall that starts the pattern and then it exists until the next fall. Yeah, I mean, for those that don't know, this is Eric, and he's a, he's a broadcast meteorologist in Orlando, and I've been following you, Eric, for a while now. I, get, I, I tune into your coffee talks and whatnot every morning, and um, I know earlier in the spring you posted, okay, these are the reoccurring parts of the LRC and when we need to watch uh, during hurricane season. You know, how did you come about the Gary's hypothesis, and, you know, how has how's this played out? So uh, I, I work for a television station in Orlando, but I also work with weather departments all across the country. And uh, so I met a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeremy Nelson, who worked with Gary several years ago. And so Gary taught Jeremy the LRC. And Jeremy and I have become friends over the years. And, and it started off with Jeremy just saying, highlight these days 
there's going to be something tropical around you. And I said, but that's six months from now. How could you possibly have a clue? And he said, just do it and I'll tell you later. So he took it on the approach of, I'm going to blow your mind and then we'll backfill it with information. And after a couple of years of him doing this, I finally said, okay, Mr. Magic, teach this to me. You're not David Copperfield. Okay, well, let's let's get right into this. And, and, and you know, for us along the Gulf Coast and certainly uh, for Eric in Central Florida, it is hurricane season. And the part about the LRC that interests me the most is exactly that and for obvious reasons. Uh, we're not dealing with uh, snowstorms on the Gulf Coast traditionally, uh, widespread tornado outbreaks breaks really aren't our thing. It's hurricane season. And and Gary, let's start talking and Eric about 2020, what happened last year, what's already happened this year, and what may be happening or is happening in the next week. And 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 explain and so what I'm going to talk about is I want to talk about Hurricane Ada from 2020, Elsa this year, and what Elsa may have to do with Fred that's currently over Cuba. How does the LRC explain these three storms? Well, the weather pattern sets up in October and November. So Ada happened around November the 10th or so. Um, and so when Ada developed, you apply the LRC to it, and then you it's about a 46 to 47 day cycle this year. And it will come out to right about mid-August for a system, but not just mid-August. 46 days earlier was late June and early July. So exactly 46 days ago, right now, we had a system forming, it was ELSA, that took a very similar path. I used the track of ADA to predict where ELSA would likely go, and it took a path very close to that. Once a system forms in hurricane season, like ELSA, it increases the probability, and I've done a 21 year analysis of hurricane seasons, it increases the probability of a stronger named system to form in another LRC cycle, which would be right now or, and or in early October. Uh, and I'll, well, I'll, and, say and, okay. I'll say this, I'll say this, I'm blown away because Eric, I saw your graphic months ago where you highlighted yeah. the west coast of Florida and you were saying, late June, early July, which was Elsa, and then you said mid-August, which relates to the hypothesis, and what were you going to say? I was just going to say, and then again, you know, using that history also assists in talking about local impact. So, for example, you know, while we may be not, while we may not be talking about a major hurricane in our area, I did an hour-long broadcast this morning, and my entire question list was, what's going to happen in my county? What's going to happen in my county? And it helps me to say, Right now, it looks like a very similar influence of what the last cycle yielded, which was Elsa. So think about Elsa, it was a breezy day, it was a cloudy day, we had some tropical downpours, but it also lets me say the next cycle, that late, late September, early October, when the water temperatures are at their peak, when theoretically the Madden Julian oscillation should, you know, all these other pieces of the puzzle come together, that may be the one that's the big one that we really are going to have to get into more hurricane concern. So it also helps to tell kind of this weather story of comparing to the past, but also letting you know, hey, if you're if you're thinking about vacations, if you're thinking about this or that, come early October, just put a little asterisk in the back of your mind. And like Jeremy told me, circle on the calendar that early October time frame as we're going to be doing this all over again, the same but subtle. OK, different. OK, this is great. Eric knows when to schedule vacations. That's that's a. <laughs> That's a wonderful <laughs> secondary benefit here of exactly. the LRC. But Gary, I want to ask you, so you said uh, the, the cycle this year is 46.3 days or something like that for the, for the repetition. What determines the cycle and are there cycles within the cycle each year, if that makes yeah, sense? There's, there's one that are called harmonics of the cycle. So um, like a lot of cycling things, if you have a 60 day cycle, then you'll have a 30 day harmonic, a 15 day harmonic, a seven and a half day harmonic, all the way down to a one day harmonic. There are these other subsets of those cycles, but you have one predominant cycle. So in October, November, let's say there's a major storm that hits the Chicago area. It's a huge storm where there's a severe weather outbreak, there's a snowstorm. Um, 
you look for that pattern to return and 46 47 days later this year the pattern returns and it's it's hard to see because it looks like chaos but it's not it's very very organized so you can also if it's 60 days or like 46 days cut it in half 23 days you'll see some hints or reflections of the bigger pattern as well and so and you have you might have little mini cycles within that cycle that repeat over seven days but overall it's one big pattern that's cycling let, let's talk about this. Let's kind of broaden out again um, with all of this, Gary. Um, you know, we've known for decades and decades about teleconnections uh, in the atmosphere and, and how large scale circulations connect with each other. We know about things like pattern repetition. We can see, uh, for instance, uh, just this summer, uh, patterns setting up where we've had ridges over us and then we continue to see this East Coast trough that's been developing. That's been going over and over. We know about things like the Arctic Oscillation and, and the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO, the PNA, all of those kind of things. What does that have to do with the LRC? I mean, are those those are, are long term, um, uh, uh, you know, circulations that don't change, you know, over short amounts of time. Most of those, you know, like the PDO and the NAO, they may stay in a certain state for years or even just for an entire year. How do those play together with uh, your uh, hypothesis? Well, well, the LRC is, is a pattern that sets up each year. So there's a unique pattern, pattern that's never happened before that sets up. El Nino, La Nina, Enzo, uh, other oscillations that you talk about, the MJO, PNA, PDO, AO, NAO out there. Uh, the Those oscillations likely have an influence on the LRC. La Nina and El Nino, I'm certain, have a significant influence. But the LRC, the river of air above us right now flowing, that is a, a, a river of air. It's a big cycling pattern over the whole northern hemisphere. And there's one over the southern hemisphere, too. Uh, that has influences, but it sets up in October. El Nino could be in one phase, La Nina could be in one phase, it could be a, a weak or moderate La Nina forming again this winter. And that could go to neutral or even to an El Nino or, or completely change phases, and yet the LRC doesn't change. But the influences on it might have other impacts. The pattern up there is still cycling regularly to what happened in October. Right now, we are in the same pattern that set up last October and these other influences are influencing it, but that's what they are, influences on something that's bigger. Now, would you, so would you say, say you set up that pattern, okay, we see the pattern, the LRC last year. Oh, say we went to an El Nino right now, where usually that means less hurricane activity. Would that dampen that pattern going forward where, okay, right now it, the, the expectation is we could have a storm return from Delta in about two weeks maybe it's just a little weak tropical storm or something like that. Those other influences, would that influence that pattern totally? Yeah, Zach, you just hit it right on the nose, really. There will still be a reflection of these systems, but if El Nino is developing and there's increased shear over the tropics, so the chance of, a, a, of named storms become less likely, then maybe there's a reflection of it and it's just a complex of thunderstorms. Uh, there have been years where I was predicting a system to come right across the Gulf of Mexico, um, and I had a company that we were working for at that point with Weather 2020, my company, and um, that we, we, if we would have hit that forecast, they said, yeah, we would have continued with you. But that year, a system crosses the Gulf of Mexico, a spinning area of little <laughs> showers, and it didn't manifest into anything. I'm like, form into something because we predicted it but there was the system was there but that year the conditions were not favorable for it to develop well and look at early like late late july early august that was the last zeta part of the pattern and there was a ton of saharan dust in place and the atmosphere wasn't doing anything in the tropics but yet you guys got a big rain event in louisiana and it went right up the east coast and if you followed its trajectory it was right there with what Zeta did. It fit the pattern, even though it wasn't tropical in nature. 
So let me, so does the LRC, and we can talk about tornado outbreaks and blizzards and all that as well. Does this mainly work with big impactful events, predicting things like that? Because last year we had 30 storms and I don't think you can find uh, a relationship for each one of those storms that it related to the cycle. Is this, is this more uh, a tool for forecasting major events like a Zeta, like the big hurricane you're saying is going to happen in mid-September or some of the huge tornado outbreaks you guys have up there in Kansas City? First of all, David, I do believe there is an earlier indication for every one of those 30 systems. Okay, within the cyclic pattern, there is something in previous cycles that would have a least a small indicator, uh, a relationship to that. Um, overall, when, the, when we get to October and November, the pattern sets up, same thing with winter storms. If there's a winter storm and you know the cycle length, you can predict when there's going to be another winter storm. This year, Oklahoma City, perfect example. They had a major ice storm at the end of October at the exact same time Zeta is coming into Louisiana. So you have Zeta coming into Louisiana, part of the pattern, and you have Oklahoma getting blasted by an extremely rare October major, major ice storm, which probably will never happen again in October in Oklahoma, mm. in Oklahoma City. What happened 46 days later as we got into December? Oklahoma City has a snowstorm, and there's a reflection of Zeta. Either Zeta or Delta had a major snowstorm in the deep south in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, I think got some snow this year from the Zeta or the Delta part of the pattern. I forget, Eric, which one it was. And you tweeted that, and the best part was you said, what would you believe? Basically, you know, it's like, would you believe me if this was because of this? And, you know, to right. anybody that's following this, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. To anybody that's not, it's so like, I mean what do you, what? But now, I need to go back and look at my tweet. I need to go back and look at my tweet to see what I wrote because that is returning now. A snowstorm can be related to a hurricane. Isn't that amazing? What about with um, what about temperature trends? Does it work with temperatures or does it just work with um, you know storms? It absolutely works with temperature trends as well. For example, if there's an Arctic outbreak in November that is caused by a mid-latitude synoptic setup, um, a big ridge in Western Canada that creates the conditions for the Arctic air, you can predict with reliability, just like the tropics, that there will be another Arctic outbreak right on schedule. And so um, we have very good success with predicting the Arctic outbreaks, severe weather outbreaks, um, I was on with uh, James Spann with his weather brains a couple years ago when uh, we knew that around Easter, we were on in February, and I said 45 days from now, around Easter weekend, you're, you're going to have a severe weather outbreak. And he goes, okay, I'm going to write that down. And <laughs> then, because uh, James is a, has been a skeptic of long-range forecasting, but he what happened on Easter Sunday two years ago? Significant outbreak, including his area in Alabama. So um, there's predictability, significant predictability for severe weather, Arctic outbreaks, heat waves, flooding events, droughts, tropical storms, hurricanes. You, you know, and I think it's interesting you bring that up. And uh, James Spann, of course, uh, one of the most respected broadcast meteorologists out there in the country as a quite a wide following nationally. Uh, you know, you talk about him being skeptical about long range forecasting. I don't know if he's skeptical in general or just skeptical of the LRC. Um, but a lot of people have pushed back against you, Gary, over the years. I've seen you having to fight for this. And, and one thing that any scientist wants is they want to be published their research and uh, they want it to be in a peer reviewed journal. That didn't happen for a long time. Um, you know, and some of that I think is uh, what we have to worry about is, is people getting caught in one mindset and one way of thinking. I mean, part of science is constantly questioning what's known because we know there's unknowns out there that have yet to have been discovered. What what was your experience like? And you did eventually get published. Uh, well, fortunately, we got a peer review paper published. 
and it's uh, called the Cycling Patterns of the Northern Hemisphere. You can Google it and, and find it if you want to look look for it. Um, and I have an article that was published in Meteorological Technology International magazine a couple years ago. So it's great to have a couple a couple of items published because. Uh, this is something that is exists for everyone to see. It's in the 1940s from Jerome de Mayas when he began to discover it to when I found it independently in the 1980s to advancing it to now. Yes, there's skeptics out there. For example, just yesterday, AccuWeather has an article out about, there's a whole article about uh, could there be atmospheric memory Okay, could there be a memory of the atmosphere? And they showed Elsa's track and they're showing Fred's track. Is that just a coincidence? And the head forecaster at AccuWeather says, is this possible? And he says, a firm no, okay? What, what, how does he know that? No, he, it's actually a firm yes, the exact opposite of what he says. But on faith, he's not gonna believe it. On faith, our peers aren't gonna believe it. We need more work, and I'm working on it, and more peer-reviewed papers, and we'll try to do that, but as a chief meteorologist on a TV station, how much time do you have to write a peer-reviewed paper? It's amazing I got one written. <laughs> and uh, great minds here today. Appreciate the conversation, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So we have the Lezak Recurring Cycle, the LRC. Wow, that is an interesting discussion. I've heard a lot about this from Gary over the years and read about it. And there are going to be a lot of skeptics out there. It's an hypothesis. That's all it is at this point in time. Uh, there, there is some empirical evidence for it. But again, I think it probably has a really long way to go. I think one thing that we want to emphasize, uh, Gary you know, started getting a little bit hyped up there and use the Katrina word uh, when talking about the pattern that we're in this summer. Uh, but again, let's let's kind of review specifically. Again, he said that this year's cycle, which started last October, uh, is a 46.3 day cycle and that we had Claudette early in the season. Right. We had and Claudette. That, and then what happened after that? OK, so Zeta is the reoccurring cycle. We hit Claudette in the middle of June. And so it reoccurred at the end of July and early August. And this goes back to, this doesn't mean a hurricane's gonna hit you every single time you reoccur that, that pattern. What did we see at the end of July, early August? We saw a cold front make it all the way down to the Gulf Coast and there was an aerial pressure that developed along the Louisiana coast and moved off to the north and east, almost like Zeta. So that's what was the reoccurring aspect of the pattern then. And now he said, we're gonna hit it again in the middle of September. So that's when we should be watching out for another type of low pressure, or could it possibly be some type of tropical system? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Cause that'll be 46 days later. And one reason when we asked him, he said, well, why didn't we get a tropical storm or a hurricane 46 days after Claudette this year? And of course he said, well, there was a lot of dry air. If you remember uh, that part of the end of June, beginning of July, after a really wet June, we finished with a much drier atmosphere and it wasn't as conducive uh, for tropical cyclone formation. So obviously this is nowhere near perfect. Uh, neither is any kind of weather forecasting because you can have very short term pattern changes or uh, conditions in the atmosphere that can make things more favorable or less favorable. And, and I don't know if we have the ability on a long time scale like he's doing uh, to make these kind of predictions. Exactly. And it's science. I mean, it's it, it's it's a hypothesis. Does it work out every time? And you always say this, it's the words of Brian Norcross. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Say it again. Uh, precision is the enemy of accuracy. So exactly. So, you know, if you're precisely trying to say a hurricane is going to come, you're probably going to get it wrong. But an area low pressure in the Gulf, you know, that's that's a tropical wave and or that's a cold front approaching the Gulf. So, you know, that whole precision thing, that's the part that everybody's going to think it's wrong. But in the end, you know, I think there is some kind of reoccurring pattern, but there's a lot of reoccurring patterns in the atmosphere. We know about the MJO. We know about PNA, the Arctic Oscillation. There's there's teleconnections. Everything's all connected together at once. This morning I did that on my uh, tracking the science segment of how everything on this earth is connected one way or another. 
Well, I think that's a good note to end on there. And a reminder, everybody, stick with us here on Fox 8 and fox8live.com for the latest on Fred as we go throughout the next few days. And, of course, for the rest of the season on whatever develops in the tropics, regardless of the uh, recurring cycle or not. For Zach Fredella, I'm David Bernard. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time.